Here's a guy who will judge the quality of your worldview. All worldviews cannot be equally true because they often contradict each other at important points. Either a god exists or he doesn't. That's a false dichotomy already. If a god does exist, that god need not use the pronoun he. Either the natural world is all that there is, or there is also a supernatural world. Which would be what exactly? What does supernatural even mean? If a worldview is true, we should be able to give reasons and evidence to show why it is sound. How does that follow? If you want to convince other people of any particular worldview, you should give reasons and evidence to demonstrate why it is sound. But a worldview can be true without evidence of its truth being accessible to us. We should be able to spot issues with false worldviews, meaning we should be able to see how they don't line up with reality. In our previous class, we looked at three major worldviews and how they describe reality according to the categories of origins, identity, morality, and purpose. In this class, I'm going to discuss three criteria for evaluating a worldview. A good worldview should be logical, literal, and livable. With these three criteria as our guide, we will look at each worldview and see if they hold up under scrutiny. What would it mean for it to be livable? Everyone who is currently alive has a worldview that is livable in the sense that it hasn't killed them yet. We have three helpful criteria for evaluating a worldview. Is the worldview logical? Is the worldview literal? And is the worldview livable? Let's talk about logical. Logical refers to the internal coherence of a worldview. Are the ideas within this worldview mutually supportive of one another, or do they conflict? If a worldview is not logically coherent, then that worldview is false. One of the basic laws of logic is the law of non-contradiction. Something cannot be both true and not true at the same time and in the same way. Here's an example. Uh, if a worldview claimed that there is no God when it comes to origins, but then claimed that man's purpose is to obey God and follow his rules perfectly when it comes to purpose, there is an obvious contradiction. That is not, in fact, a contradiction. As you said yourself, a contradiction is a claim that something is both true and not true at the same time and in the same way. To say that there is a God who dictates morality, but not a God that created the universe, is to say that a God exists in one way, but does not exist in another way. Thus, such a statement is not contradictory. This worldview could not be correct. One worldview with a clear logical contradiction is relativism. Now, relativism falls under the major worldview of naturalism. They believe God does not exist, therefore objective moral standards do not exist. First of all, you don't have to be a naturalist to be a relativist. Secondly, it doesn't follow that if a God does not exist, then objective moral standards do not exist. I don't believe that objective moral standards exist whether a God exists or not. So the non-existence of objective moral standards does not follow from the existence or non-existence of God. A common claim of a relativist is there is no truth. Actually, the opposite is the case. Relativists don't say there is no truth. They say that truth is relative, which means that there can be a multitude of different truths rather than no truth. This statement is clearly not logical. It violates the law of non-contradiction. If the statement is true that there is no truth, then there is at least one truth, the truth that there is no truth. Thus, the statement is contradictory. Making this assertion undercuts the very thing it is trying to claim. If the statement is true, then it is false. What relativists even say there is no truth? I hear them say that there is no objective truth, and detractors fallaciously conflate that with saying that there is no truth at all, but these assertions are not the same. The statement there is no objective truth is not self-contradictory unless someone intends it to mean that it is objectively true that there is no objective truth. If the statement is only meant relatively or subjectively, then it is not contradictory. There's another way that the logical criteria can help us to evaluate a worldview. Now, many people treat a worldview like it's a swirled view. What I mean by that is they swirl together ideas that they like from many different worldviews, or they collect contradictory ideas as if a worldview is like a buffet. The problem is mix and match worldviews do not fit together or reinforce each other. 
Well, that would depend on which elements of which worldviews you mix together, wouldn't it? Some beliefs from some worldviews may contradict one another, but others might be perfectly consistent with one another. We can use the logical criteria to show the contradictory nature of a swirled view. An example of this would be the Unitarian Universalists. Now, this liberal religion encompasses many faith traditions and has a few specific theological beliefs. The Unitarian Universalist Association website says, Explore the links below to learn how Unitarian Universalists weave these traditions and identities into who they are today. It then lists atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, Christian, earth-centered, Hindu, humanist, Jewish, Muslim. These different worldviews cannot be harmonized. They conflict on major issues. Consequently, the Unitarian Universalist swirled view means they live in constant contradiction. Again, that depends on which elements from each of these religions you mix together with one another. They obviously would have a hard time mixing the exclusive monotheism of Islam with the explicit polytheism of Hinduism, for example. Is that what they do, though? Do Unitarians believe that both polytheism and monotheism are both true at the same time and in the same way? Now let's move on to our second criteria, literal. Is the worldview literal? factual? Does the worldview literally reflect reality? Are there facts and evidence in the real world that support this worldview? Is there evidence against this worldview being true? These are the types of questions that the literal criteria seeks to answer. Why is this even a necessary criterion? If your worldview incorporates stories that are not literally true, but you understand that they aren't literally true, and you apply them only metaphorically, then what's the problem? Even Jesus did this all the time. He told parables that were not intended literally. They were simply illustrative. As Frank Turek often says, when Jesus said, I am the door, he didn't mean that he had hinges. Naturalism is not literal. Its answers to origins does not fit with the way the world actually is. What reason do you have to believe that there are things in the universe that are not natural? What would that even mean? Naturalism is the idea that everything is ultimately the product of nature, which includes things artificially created by organisms. What reason do we have to believe that there is anything in reality that was not created by nature or organisms? The natural world, the universe, had a beginning. It's not eternal. And this can be demonstrated both scientifically and philosophically. The scientific evidence from the second law of thermodynamics teaches that given enough time, the universe and all its processes will run out of usable energy. That's only true if you assume that the total amount of usable energy in the universe is finite. Simply put, the universe is cooling down. If the universe is eternal, then it would have already run out of energy. Not if the total amount of energy is infinite. Now, from what I've seen, the universe looks like it's finite in the past, but not because of entropy. It looks finite in the past because of the speed with which it has been expanding seems to indicate that everything was condensed into a singularity 13.7 billion years ago. However, we are here today in a universe that still has heat. Therefore, the universe cannot be eternal. The scientific evidence actually supports theism. If God created the universe, then the universe had a beginning. Well, one would be committing the fallacy of affirming the consequent if one were to take that premise and the premise that the universe has a beginning and then draw the conclusion that the universe was created by God. It just doesn't follow. Also, the beginning of the universe would also be the beginning of time. And how can an act of creation occur without time already existing? What would it mean to create something or do anything at all without time in which to carry out such an act? Why would a naturalist hold on to naturalism if there's compelling evidence that the literal world is not the way their worldview describes? They wouldn't, and they don't. The literal world is perfectly consistent with what naturalism describes. Not only is there no evidence that anything exists which is not ultimately the product of nature, it's not clear what it would even mean for something to exist which is not the product of nature. Of what else could something be the product? What even is a god? If a god is not natural, what is it? What does it mean to say that something is supernatural? Until we have a definition, we can't even know what evidence for such a thing would look like. Well, the late Richard Lewontin, who was an evolutionary biologist, tells us, he says, evolutionists have a prior commitment 
a commitment to naturalism. No, it's not a commitment. It's a complete inability to understand what the alternative is or how it could be incorporated into scientific inquiry. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. What supernatural explanation for anything would or even could be less mystifying than a naturalist explanation? What is a divine foot? Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. How could we distinguish a divine foot from any other variety of causation? It's not that we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. It's just that we have no idea what a divine foot would actually look like or what it would even mean for it to step through the door. This is a denial of the literal world, the actual world. How so? If you have a means of distinguishing divine causes from physical causes, I'd like to hear what that means is, and I'd like to see what you think constitutes evidence of such causes. And it's an assertion of a worldview that fits with how Lewontin wants things to be. In our first class, we learned it doesn't matter whether a certain worldview works for us or fits with how we want things to be. The question to ask is, does it work with the way the world really is? Naturalism fails the literal criteria. Again, how so? Give me one example of an observable supernatural phenomenon. Let's talk about the third criteria, livable. Is this worldview livable? We have to ask, do my beliefs allow me to live and behave according to the way the world really is? I'm not sure I understand what that means. You don't have to even understand much about how the world works in order to live a long, happy life in it. Hinduism is an example of a worldview that is not livable when it comes to origins. The belief that the material world is maya, an illusion, is not a livable view. Every minute of every day, the Hindu interacts with the material world as if it were real. When I have lucid dreams, I know that what I'm experiencing is a dream, but I still interact with it as though it is real because it is enjoyable to do so. The idea that the world is illusory is entirely livable. To deny the reality of the material world would cause huge problems. Not eating illusory food, not caring about ingesting illusionary poison, not taking care of your illusory body, etc. Nonsense. There are lots of Hindus in the world, and very few stop eating food or taking care of themselves. Even if it were proven to me that I am living in the Matrix, I'd still enjoy eating my illusory poutine and bathing my illusory body. Hindus betray their worldview when they look both ways before crossing a busy intersection. No, they don't. If you get hit by an illusory car and feel illusory pain, that will still suck. That will still be an unpleasant experience worth avoiding, even if it is illusory. This view is not livable, and thus it should be abandoned. If it's not livable, then how do the many millions of Hindus in the world live by it? Buddhism is not livable when it comes to identity, what a human being is. One of the key components of Buddhism is that our desires lead to suffering. So in order to eliminate suffering, we must eliminate desire. This is an unlivable concept. It's imploring us to desire not to desire. But if you achieve that, then the desire is satisfied and goes away, so what's the problem? If I attempt to do this, I am failing at doing so because I'm desiring not to desire. This is not something a human being can accomplish no matter how much meditation they practice. Naturalism is not livable when it comes to purpose, specifically personal significance. Even though naturalists admit there is no ultimate purpose to human existence, they can't live this out. Instead, they create smaller purposes they know won't matter in the grand scheme of the universe. So what? Those purposes are more than enough to satisfy me, so what's the problem? But they need a purpose to keep living anyway. Skeptic Michael Shermer said, Play hard, work hard, love hard. The bottom line for me is to live life to the fullest in the here and now instead of a hoped for hereafter. 
and make every day count in some meaningful way and do something, no matter how small it is, to make the world a better place. The irony of Shermer's statement is that naturalism believes the universe is a cause and effect system that is not open to reordering. First of all, naturalism in no way assumes determinism. Random events can occur while still being entirely natural. Secondly, it's only insofar as the universe is at least partially a cause and effect system that it can be open to reordering. To reorder something is to cause it to have the effect of being in a different order. This means that everything is cause and effect, including humans. We're just sophisticated machines. There is no choice of our will to make every day count or to make the world a better place. First of all, that's not true. God is not necessary in order for the universe to have non-deterministic events. Quantum mechanics and aspects of thermodynamics show every sign of being non-deterministic to at least some degree. Secondly, even if everything were deterministic, why would that matter? Even if everything our will does is predetermined, why can't our will be predetermined to make the world a better place? Every decision we have ever made was predetermined by causes external to us. Since according to naturalism, every human action is determined, humans are unable to truly act free. Again, naturalism and determinism are two different things. If everything is natural, but there are at least some natural events, which are chance events rather than determined events, then naturalism would be true and complete determinism would be false. But even if determinism were true, how would that prevent us from making the world a better place? Even if our desire to make the world a better place were predetermined and everything we did to accomplish that were also predetermined, that in no way prevents us from accomplishing that goal. This removes human responsibility. Our choices for good or for bad are not really our choices. We're just reacting to previous causes. And if we're not reacting to previous causes, then we're acting randomly, and we're also not responsible. As Sam Harris said in his book on free will, either our wills are determined by prior causes and we are not responsible for them, or they are the product of chance and we are not responsible for them. What alternative is there? No one lives as if this were true. I do. We can't. I can. In fact, I don't even understand what the alternative would be. We know that we are responsible for our choices and our actions. Naturalists act as if they are making a difference. They write books to persuade people to change their view on religion, all the while believing that humans cannot choose to do other than what cause and effect has determined. You seem to think this is a contradiction when, in fact, it follows quite sensibly. It's actually precisely because I believe in cause and effect with respect to people's beliefs that I try to convince anyone of anything. What would be the point of trying to convince someone of something if I didn't believe that the effort I put into convincing them played any causal role whatsoever in determining their beliefs? What this dude is saying is the exact opposite of true. It is only if determinism is true, to at least some degree, that there is any point to making arguments. If there were no cause and effect relationship whatsoever between arguments and beliefs, what would be the point of making arguments? To everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.